Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. And with that, I'm honored to introduce from the UK, Lord Christopher Monckton. My Lord, that's me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to accept Commissioner Rothschild's invitation to address you today. You may be puzzled at why a British peer without a seat or a vote uh, can nevertheless have something to contribute to the future of Maryland's planning. But the particular matter that he has asked me to address is the question of global warming. And in particular, I've been asked to look at both the Climate Action Plan and the Comprehensive Climate Report of the Planning Department of the State of Maryland and also Plan Maryland and to give it a thoroughgoing economic as well as scientific review. Now, several of you may have been sent by the usual suspects an 80-page document attacking a four-page testimony that I gave in front of the US Congress last year. That document was written by 16 of the ClimateGate emailers and five of their cronies. They all have a very strong financial and political vested interest in trying to make out that I am not competent in the fields in which I'm about to address you. Therefore, I have structured my presentation in such a way that I am going to base what I say to you very closely on the establishment science and economics and merely draw logical conclusions. Every piece of data I use will be sourced so you know where I got it from. Every equation I use will be displayed. I shall be very happy to answer questions in detail either during uh, this uh, event or afterwards in writing. My aim is not in any way to interfere in your politics at all. I am here purely to do a technocratic job of examining the scientific premises behind Plan Maryland and also the economic consequences of the actions which are proposed in Plan Maryland in, and in the Climate Action Plan to try to make global warming go away. I'm here in a constructive and friendly and irenic spirit and I should welcome any questions in particular that Secretary Hall and the Governor's Office may have about this presentation and I shall be very willing to assist them afterwards in correcting those parts of the plan which are, in my submission, deficient. You've already heard from Commissioner Cindy Jones that there doesn't appear to be much of an economic argument in Plan Maryland and that indeed is something which will have to be addressed. But let me first of all say what I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to get into the question of whether global warming is a good thing or a bad thing, whether there are benefits from more CO2, there are, whether we, there is as much radiation getting to outer space as we are told should be happening, whether the oceans are hiding the global warming that stopped 10 years ago. We're not going to talk about the climate gate emails except to quote one of them at a particular point, And we're not going to talk about matters other than the greenhouse gas question. What we are going to cover are questions which Plan Maryland and the Climate Action Plan should have addressed, but unfortunately didn't address. First of all, we need to know how much warming will Plan Maryland abate if it is implemented in full. The plan doesn't say what that answer is. I'm going to show you what the answer is. And in showing you the answer, I'll show you why they didn't say. I'm going to look at what the plan's climate policies would actually cost, because again they don't say. I'm going to ask how mitigation cost effective is the plan, both against other policies that might be followed to try to make global warming go away, and also against the cost of doing nothing, letting global warming happen to the extent that is imagined by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and its supporters, and whether simply sitting back enjoying the sunshine and doing nothing would be more cost effective than the measures advocated in the Climate Action Plan and in Plan Maryland itself. Once again a question not addressed, and Cindy Jones is quite right about this, not addressed in either of these documents. What is going to be the cost then of total climate inaction? We need to know that. And is the do nothing option a cost effective option? That should be considered. 
So I'm going to begin with an economic appraisal of the climate aspects of Plan Maryland. Not of Plan Maryland as a whole, just the climate aspects. And the first assertion which I'm going to uh, question is this one. Plan Maryland says, as greenhouse gas emissions are linked to climate change, Maryland and other coastal states need to ensure they are reduced. More work needs to be done to curb greenhouse gas emissions throughout Maryland. There is the premise that we have to do something about global warming. And there is implied in that premise the suggestion that if we do do something about global warming, we will make a significant difference at an affordable cost. Is that a justifiable premise? And the mitigation working group, and I had this drawn to my attention yesterday by uh, Commissioner Rothschild's assistant, Cathy, is, says this. As a core element of its climate action plan, the state would adopt the science-based greenhouse gas emission reduction goals recommended by the Commission, and these include a 90% reduction below 2006 levels of greenhouse gas emissions in 2050, in less than 40 years from now. 90% of the economy of Maryland is to be shut down. That is in their proposals. It isn't actually in the plan, but it's in one of the associated documents. And it's as well to understand that that is how drastic these proposals are. 90% of all economic activity in Maryland will disappear according to this plan. Now what then are the case-specific economic assumptions which I'm going to use in analysing what is the cost and what are the benefits of this approach to the climate. Well, first of all, I'm starting with the figure of 90% of Maryland's emissions, which emissions and therefore its economy, which are to be abated by 2050. Maryland represents 1.5% of US emissions. US uh, represents uh, around 18.7% of global emissions, which means that the fraction of global emissions that will be abated if Plan Maryland's proposals are implemented in full is around a quarter of 1%. And that, uh, we also need to know what would CO2 concentration be in 2050 if we did nothing to mitigate global warming. It would be 506 parts per million by volume according to the IPCC on its scenario A2. How much warming will occur by that time on that scenario? 1 Celsius more or less exactly. Global annual GDP in 2010 was 60 trillion. It's growing at around 3% per year globally and is expected to do so. I got that figure from a, a member of the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee. The minimum intertemporal discount rate that should be used in investment appraisals is the minimum rate of return on capital, which is around 5%. That's a rather low figure, but we're being nice to Plan Maryland, so we're going to use the lowest practicable figure. I will justify that figure later. We're also going to look at the cost of the plan, which uh, we're going to discount to present value at uh, 5%, and that's around 7.3 trillion US dollars, representing 90% of the total gross domestic product of Maryland. Now, it may be argued from the other side that if you shut down 90% of the carbon emissions, you aren't shutting down 90% of the economy. Yes, you are unless you introduce major forms of generation to replace the greenhouse gas emitting ones, such as nuclear, but that is not adumbrated anywhere in either of these documents. Without that, you will be closing down most of your economy, as California is already doing, with the consequent reduction in the tax base and facing of bankruptcy as businesses move out to climates more favourable. And you don't want that happening here. Global GDP then over the period of the plan is 1.7 quadrillion US dollars. So those are the assumptions I'm starting with. Now the global assumptions, I'm going to use the Stern report in 2006 for Her Majesty's Treasury where he says that it would only cost 1% of GDP to make global warming go away, an enormous underestimate. And he says that at the IPCC's central estimate of 3 or 3.5 Celsius of warming over the 21st century as a result of our actions, that would cost 3% of GDP if we did nothing. And it's worth remembering it's only 3% is his estimate of the IPCC's central estimate of how much warming we're going to get. 
If you were to push that up to 5 or 6 Celsius, he says that between 5 and 20% of global GDP could uh, disappear if we did nothing. However, in order to get that figure, he has used a very low 0.1% discount rate, and I will be uh, discussing the appropriateness of that uh, later. For reference there, there's the Garneau report in Australia, rather more realistic figures for the cost of climate action, still a rather unrealistic figure for the, un uh, the climate inaction cost, and a slightly less unrealistic but still very low range of discount rates. Now, costs are external to shutting down most of Maryland and benefits external to mitigation of CO2 forcing are not going to form part of this analysis, nor should they. Uh, GDP growth rates and welfare losses from climate inaction are going to be assumed uniform throughout the next century. And most importantly, I am going to adopt for the purposes of all my economic calculations the IPCC's climatology ad argumentum as though it were in all respects correct. And I'm going to base all my figures on the IPCC's central estimate that there will be 3.26 Kelvin plus or minus 0.69 of warming over the current century in response to the doubling of CO2 concentration, which the IPCC expects to occur over that century in the absence of any action. To summarize the IPCC's relevant uh, data for the purposes of this economic analysis, I'm assuming that the climate sensitivity parameter that applies in uh, the last and this century is 0.5 Celsius per watt per square meter, and you can see there that that parameter is derivable from all six of the IPCC's standard emissions scenarios. I'm also assuming uh, again, derivable from the, each of those scenarios individually, that CO2 represents 70% of all man-made greenhouse gas forcings. Those are the IPCC data on which I will be basing my costings. Now, would, therefore, this 90% shutdown of Maryland actually work? Well, the first thing you need to know is that if this policy were pursued for 40 years and were successful in reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 90%, then the amount of global warming that would be forestalled in 40 years would be 0 0.0015 Celsius. That is less than one one-thousandth of a Fahrenheit degree. The equation there shows how that is calculated. I don't propose to go through the equation in detail now. I will be very happy to talk to you or any of your economic analysts about that afterwards. Now, why is it as little as that? It is because the projected business as usual CO2 concentration by 2050, it's ringed there, would be 506 parts per million, and under the full implementation of a 90% shutdown of Maryland, you would reduce that to 505.707. That's why you get so little reduction in uh, radiative forcing and hence so little reduction in global warming. So how mitigation cost effective is this? And with the way we measure the cost effectiveness, the mitigation cost effectiveness of a CO2 reduction measure is you work out the cost of abating a standard unit, one Celsius of CO2 driven warming by policies as cost effective or cost ineffective as Maryland's 90% shutdown on the assumption that such policies were applied globally. And that gives you a cost of reducing one Celsius of otherwise occurring global warming of 4.7 quadrillion dollars. And a quadrillion is a one with 15 zeros after it. It is one times 10 to the 15th. It's the equivalent of 140 years global GDP to make one Celsius of the three and a quarter Celsius of warming that's expected to occur this century disappear. Then we need to look at the cost of getting rid of all warmings that would otherwise have occurred over the period, which by coincidence is also one Celsius in this example. Uh, if we use policies again as cost effective as that in Maryland, and this time we're including not only CO2 but all the other greenhouse gases, and that puts up your cost of mitigation to 6.7 quadrillion per uh, to get rid of one Celsius of warming that would otherwise have occurred over the period, that's nearly one million dollars per head of the global population. And it is 409% of global GDP over the period. Now these are extraordinary figures, but they are figures which you can very easily verify for yourselves. 
So uh, this clearly is not looking very good for Plan Maryland. And the, the essential point is that if you're trying to make global warming go away, whether you're doing it at the level of a state or whether you're doing it globally, what we're beginning to see here is that the cost of trying to make global warming go away is likely to exceed the cost of letting the climate warm and letting the damage happen and paying the cost of that damage even if the warming is as great as the IPCC says it is on which these figures are based and even if the damage that results is as great as they say or rather as Stern says it will be because he has exaggerated both the amount of warming expected compared with the IPCC and the amount of damage that would result from that warming and yet we're going to take his figures as the basis so as to go as far as with the other side of the case in the argument. So we now need to find out how much it costs just to sit back and do nothing and take the cost of the damage and of course we use the Stern report as the benchmark. Now we need to start by working out the discount to present value. Now present value is simply the value to us today of future dollars but at today's prices. A dollar today after all is worth more valuable to us than two dollars to somebody else a hundred years from now. And we've got to find out what is the appropriate rate. Here is Stern's justification for using a 0.1% rate. Effectively what he's doing is he's saying there's a one in a thousand chance of global complete catastrophe as a result of the climate, therefore we'll use that as the discount rate. There is no precedent in the economic literature for any such way of doing things and he has been universally criticised, including in his own journal, World Economics, for taking so low a discount rate. So the correct discount rate, here are the considerations uh, from President Klaus of the Czech Republic, a formidable free market economist, and he says that by assuming a very low, near zero discount rate, the proponents of the global warming doctrine neglect the issue of time and of alternative opportunities. Using a low discount rate in global warming models means harming current generations and undermining current economic development also harms future generations. Everybody loses if you monkey with the discount rate. What then is the correct discount rate? Well it is 5%. And Klaus gets that by looking at economic papers from both sides of the divide on the climate and they are both in agreement, both sides, that 5% is the minimum acceptable rate. That's the rate I shall use, therefore, and we can now calculate the cost of inaction. And the first thing we have to do to calculate this is to use this delightfully simple little equation that you see on the screen now. And this equation simply says if you take the GDP over the 21st century, growing at 3% and then discounted at 0.1%, you want to know what that would be if you discounted it at 5% instead. And if you look at the ringed quantity there, where Stern imagines that the cost of inaction is 3% of GDP, once you adjust over 100 years for the discount rate of 5% that he should have used, it means the cost to us of doing absolutely nothing about the climate, even if his exaggerated imagined disasters are true, even if his exaggerated increase over the IPCC central estimate of warming is true, it comes down from 3% of GDP, which is not a lot anyway, to just 0.2% of GDP globally over the 21st century. This slide is a very important slide. Nobody until now has ever sat down and done this relatively simple uh, calculation, but there is the answer. And I'm presenting this shortly at the Santa Fe Climate Conference organised by the Los Alamos uh, Nat National Laboratory. Now how does this apply then to uh, Plan Maryland? Well we've already seen that Plan Maryland is going to be something like 409% of global GDP to make the global warming over the period of the plan go away. Uh, we see that in fact 0.22% of GDP is the centennial cost of doing nothing and therefore it is 1,844 times more expensive to make global warming go away by measures as cost ineffective as the Maryland plan as it would be to sit back, enjoy the sunshine and do nothing and more importantly to spend all that money on something a whole lot more useful. Now it doesn't matter what discount rate you take there is the market discount rate on the right, Stern's discount rate on the left, the two Garneau rates and the central treasury rate in the middle. With all of them, even the Stern discount rate, you're looking at a one to two order of magnitude um, excess 
in the cost of action over inaction if you do things the way the Maryland plan uh, says it will do them. And now I think, ladies and gentlemen, you can see why it is that they have left out any such calculation from Plan Maryland. Because anyone who does this kind of calculation is not going to come too far out of the ballpark in which these figures are. And it is a ballpark which says to you very plainly that the one thing you should not be spending any money at all on at the moment is trying to make global warming go away. There is a case for adaptation. You have a sea level problem, which is largely a local problem rather than a global one. I will be talking about that later. Focused adaptation is sensible. Any attempt at mitigation is entirely pointless, as these figures compellingly show. Now, Plan Maryland then says, well, as a, as a first step, we're going to reduce 25% of statewide greenhouse gas emissions from 2006 levels by the year uh, 2020. Well, here is the result of how much global warming would go away if they did that. You'll be pleased to see it's one twenty thousandth of a Celsius degree. And that is one one thousandth of the minimum threshold below which no amount of global warming that has happened or been prevented can be detected or measured by any modern method or instrument. In other words, even if Plan Maryland were to work in full over the next eight or ten years, they would have absolutely no way of measuring that it had. That is how ludicrous all of this literally is. Now you'll see that, um, again, the problem is that there's virtually no reduction in the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, even by full implementation of this phase of the plan. And there's one more, uh, which I'm going to cover off very briefly on the economic side before I turn to the science. And this is that compact development leads people to drive 20 to 40 percent less at minimal reduced costs, whereas extended uh, uh, low density development and roadway extension will increase vehicle usage, a major component of greenhouse gas emissions. Well, that, of course, is only part of the story. There is quite a considerable body of evidence, uh, such as Alice Coleman's work in London from the 1980s and many uh, such studies since, that show that total energy consumption tends to be higher per person in cities than in suburbs and country. It's not just the energy from driving, it's also the energy from lifts and common parts of you call them elevators, and common parts of buildings. All of these things have to be factored in. You also have to factor in the, the, the fact that a lot of people in cities tend to be poorer than those who live in the country, and that's the reason why their energy consumption is left. If you force the rich people to live in the cities too, then the energy consumption per person in the cities will rise. And there's a series of studies on this. So the fundamental premise of uh, Plan Maryland, which is that compact development uses less energy, uh, is not necessarily correct and requires to be very carefully reviewed. And there will be other speakers talking more about that later. So the economic conclusions, very briefly then, is that the economic shutdown, we're looking at a million pounds a head, we're looking at a, a ludicrously expensive mitigation cost effectiveness, we're looking virtually no change in CO2 concentration, 0.0015 Celsius of warming abated over 40 years by a 90% shutdown of Maryland. And I'm assuming, incidentally, in these figures, that the shutdown is immediate, rather than being phased in over those 40 years. Now, the, the next thing I thought we'd, we'd do, well, just so you know what it's going to cost you and how little benefit you'll get. It's very important to understand this. So now we come on to the question of whether CO2 mitigation is cost effective by the Maryland plan. And here you will see three little groups of different policies that are being tried out or, or suggested. First of all, the three at the top in red are optimistic government assumptions of what it might cost and how much benefit you might get in terms of making global warming go away. And you'll see that they are all about an order of magnitude, about a factor of 10 to 20 or 40, more expensive to take action than not. Then you get real-world policies actually being put into effect. Look at the Sanit wind farm there. 400 times more expensive to make global warming go away by using that wind farm or other wind farms like it. And that, because it's a big offshore wind farm, is one of the least inefficient of the wind farms in the world. It's the largest wind farm project in the world. 435 times more expensive to make global warming go away doing that than to take the damage from not making it go away. 
Likewise, EU CU tra C CO2 trading, a real policy, a real cost, uh, getting on for three orders of magnitude greater than doing nothing. Then you get into what I call the gesture politics ban, those four at the bottom, where unfortunately abolish Maryland or close it down or shut down 90% of it happens to come. And there you see you're looking at three to four orders of magnitude. 1,000 to 10,000 or even 50,000 times more expensive to take action to make global warming go away than to do nothing. It is astonishing that nobody until now has actually done these figures policy by policy to show just how crazy all this is. And then you have to add the federal costs. And these two are very high. Here is the, uh, an estimate of industry association. I don't warrant these figures. I haven't checked them personally. However, they, they posit a substantial cut in household income by 2030 on the left there and a gas price increase uh, again uh, of a very large amount on the right. To add the federal policies to the state policies to get the total cost to the people. And just to rub this in, the policies that I've looked at, including that of Plan Maryland, are likely to be even less cost effective than the metric I have used, which is a economic metric, indicates. Why? Because I've assumed, and this is really a pretty impossible assumption, that policies will mitigate as much emission as is claimed for them. And here's a very important point. If the residence time of CO2 in the atmosphere is 50 to 200 years, average 125 years, as the IPCC tells us it is, who am I to argue? <laughs> then in that case, you will get no saving whatsoever from the damage caused by CO2 into the atmosphere at any time at all within this century. It's blindingly obvious that you won't. And so it's worth drawing your attention to that point. This was a point that Václav Klaus picked out from my presentation on this subject, on my paper on this, which is about to be published in the Journal of Economic Policy. And uh, he, he has been taking it round the lecture circuit and saying, why are we doing all this, given that if the IPCC is right, whatever we do can make no difference this century at all. So going on then, we'll summarise the economic points here, and then I'm going to go very quickly through the scientific ones. No policy to abate global warming by taxing, trading, reg reducing, replacing or regulating greenhouse gas emissions will prove cost effective solely on grounds of the welfare benefit from climate mitigation. There is absolutely no doubt whatsoever about that and those who argue that I must accept the scientific consensus as for the sake of argument I am doing uh, today must also accept the economic consensus, which is very nearly unanimous in the peer-reviewed literature, which is that it is many times, indeed many orders of magnitude, cheaper and more cost-effective to do nothing and to adapt in a focused way to any climate change that may occur, when and wh if and where and only to the extent that it occurs, than it is to try to spend a single penny now on trying to make global warming stop. CO2 mitigation strategies that are inexpensive enough to be affordable will be ineffective. Strategies costly enough to be effective will be unaffordable. Once again, focused adaptation is the way forward. And so, as we say on the London insurance market, since the cost of the premium exceeds the cost of the risk, don't insure. Now I turn to the scientific analysis and here what I'm going to do is once again point out various data and evidence, not views from me, evidence, all of it sourced. I see the gentleman from Accuracy in Media sitting there looking daggers at me. I dare not get it wrong or I shall be punished for it. So I'm going to use once again, just as I have up until now, official data, official data which for some reason did not make it into Maryland's assessment of climate change. They've only given you a very partial, very one-sided view of the climate question. I propose to remedy that now. First of all, Plan Maryland says that sea level rise is of particular concern. You have a large coastline. The aim of the plan, they say, is to minimise future impacts from sea level rise in low-lying areas. Sea level rises, they, they forecast, are 1.4 feet by 2050, 3.4 feet by 2100. They even look at scenarios of sea level rise going up to 5 to 10 feet and produce lurid maps showing how much of Maryland will be wiped out 
under these extreme scenarios. But how reasonable are these scenarios? Of course, the matters are complicated here because you are uh, Chesapeake Bay is over and perhaps formed originally by a very large meteor impact crater where the compaction under the uh, area of impact continues to lower the land level which makes it look as though sea level is rising when in fact the land is falling. That is compounded by isostatic recovery following the last ice age. Many of you are too young to remember this, but the last ice <laughs> went from America uh, 9,000 years ago. And we are still seeing the rebound of the west coast of America. That is driving the east coast, particularly in Maryland, beneath the waves, quite regardless of the overall iso or eustatic, I should say, level of, sea of the sea. So, here is the official IPCC basis for sea level rise. It shows sea level rising uh, since 1993, when the Topex Poseidon satellite went up, at a rate not of 5 to 10 feet per century, nor even 3.4 feet per century, but around 1 foot per century. That's the data. There it is. Get used to it. Until my next slide, because more recent satellites have gone up. Here, for instance, is the Aviso Envisat, a much more advanced satellite than Topex Poseidon. It was launched in 2002 and began producing well-calibrated data at the beginning of 2004. The rate of sea level rise over the last eight years, as demonstrated by the latest and most sophisticated of our satellites, is equivalent to two inches per century. Now that should have been included in the climate assessment made by the governor and his staff. You mustn't leave out the data that disagrees with you. You have to show all the data on both sides of the argument so that a mature view can be formed. And there is a more recent satellite. I don't put too much weight on this slide because the satellite hasn't been up there for very long. This is Jason 2. And it shows a sea level fall over the last three years equivalent to 1.5 inches per century. These last two satellite slides, the Envisat slide and the Jason slide, of course, do not fit with the lurid predictions either of the IPCC, still less of Plan Maryland. So sea level is likely to prove to be much less of a problem in Maryland than the usual suspects would like to have you believe. And I do this on the basis of having taken the data off the satellites a few days before I came to give this presentation. Well, then Plan Maryland says worsening coastal storms will happen, storm surges, tropical hurricanes, so forth, extreme weather events generally. Well, all right, 2005 was a bad year, largely because of Katrina, which was actually only Category 3 by the time it hit land, but uh, the reason why that did so much damage was nothing to do with global warming. It what was, and I'm not going to say what kind of an administration it was in New Orleans that had failed to maintain the levees properly, but that's why the damage was done. Nothing whatever to do with the intensity of the storm. And you'll see that the darker figures there, which are for major hurricanes, show absolutely no trend in 100 years. And indeed, I've got the data from NOAA recently. Even if you go back 150 years, there is absolutely no increase in the frequency, uh, incidence, or duration of the major hurricanes and storms. It isn't happening, notwithstanding about one Celsius of warming over that period. And indeed, if we look at the combined accumulated cyclone energy index, the combined frequency, intensity, and duration of all tropicans, tropical cyclones, hurricanes, and typhoons all around the world, compiled by my friend Dr. Ryan Maui at uh, Florida State University, you're looking at the lowest level of hurricane and tropical storm activity worldwide since the satellites went up 30 years ago. You will not, for some reason, have seen this figure in your newspapers. More alarmingly, this figure, this fact, is not included in Plan Maryland or in the Governor's Climate Assessment. If we look at the sheer number of global tropical storms and hurricanes, also compiled by Dr. Maui, you'll see that both globally and in the Northern Hemisphere, and the difference between the two, of course, is the Southern Hemisphere, it is falling over the period in which warming has increased. Why is this? Because if warming increases, then although you get more energy in the system, what drives storms is not raw energy, but the difference between different temperature states at different parts of the system. If the whole thing warms up, the difference between extremes of hot and cold diminishes, 
and therefore certainly outside the tropics and arguably on this data inside the tropics you would actually express you would expect less in the way of severe storms and not as you are usually told more this is standard meteorology I'm not telling you anything that you can't find in any standard textbook well then you hear a lot about how hurricane losses particularly in 2005 again largely not to do with global warming have risen if we adjust those losses to take into account for the increase in population and in the density of building of homes and industrial activities in harm's way then you see that 1926 was far worse than 2005 and that there's really no trend in that uh, figure either then we come to changing precipitation patterns well so it's going to rain either a bit more or a bit less so what well here we are Maryland's precipitation has indeed risen not by very much over the last hundred and odd years but the extreme uh, wetness to extreme drought index what is known as the Palmer drought severity index number which you see on the left there you'll see there's been absolutely no trend it's a zero trend throughout the period of record and then we get hotter summers and their adverse impacts supposed well hey I know you get hot and beastly humid summers here I don't want it to get any hotter but I'm from Scotland and I can tell you we want hotter summers <laughs> But when you're told, as you are in Plan Maryland and in the Climate Plan, that there's going to be increased heat-related deaths, well, once again, this doesn't prove to be the case. If you look at the histograms for each of the states, including the eastern relevant states there, you'll see that in different periods, the 1970s, the 1980s, and the 1990s, respectively, for which we the amount of heat-related deaths per head of population has actually been falling relentlessly because we're able to install air conditioning, we're able to give people better education, warn them when the heat waves are coming, etc. And we have means of dealing with this which the less sophisticated, less well-developed society which is advocated in Plan Maryland would not be able to cope with. So once again, there's much less of a problem there than you might think. And if anybody just because of global warming, then malaria or West Nile virus or any of these other things uh, are going to spread. No, they're not. You can see here how quickly malaria was eradicated between 1882 and 1912 throughout most of the central belt of America by simple measures of public health control. It is that and not heat which determines whether you're going to get malaria. The malaria mosquito, the Anopheles mosquito, is perfectly capable of surviving in temperatures of up to minus 25 Celsius. The largest outbreak of malaria in modern times was in Siberia in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, something like 13 million people were infected, 600,000 died, 30,000 of them, north of the Arctic Circle in the port of Arkhangelsk. So if anybody tells you that malaria is going to spread because of global warming, no, it is not. Likewise, West Nile virus, here you can see the spread from 1999, top left, to 2007, bottom right. You can see that it spread entirely geographically and without any regard to latitude or temperature. It is insensitive to temperature, and the reason why it has spread so uniformly is that it doesn't choose a single type of mosquito as its host, as the malaria uh, Plasmodium falciparum does. Instead, it chooses anything up to 40 different kinds of mosquito, which happen to be prevalent throughout the United States. So once again, nothing whatever to do with global warming. Then they say agriculture will suffer adverse impacts from global warming. Well, more will be said about that later. I merely show you this one slide of corn yield and soybean yield over the period since 1950 when in Maryland we've seen a, a 1 Celsius rise in temperature. It doesn't look to me like a pattern of great agricultural decline. Then we have temperature change and its adverse impacts. Well, once again, there are the Maryland temperature anomalies, about uh, uh, 0.1 Celsius per decade of increase, but hey, in Britain, we did better than that. We managed 0.4 Celsius per decade. Oh, that was between 1695 and 1735, by the way, which was rather before we had all that many SUVs in the United Kingdom. <laughs> and here is the global warming from 2001 to 2011. There wasn't any. And so then we get the consensus. We keep being told about the consensus. Governor O'Malley has accepted the consensus. The words consensus merely mean the party line. And the science has nothing to do with any 
party line. Science is about looking, as we have looked today, at the actual data. And if we look at some of the things the IPCC has got up to, we may need to be a bit more careful. When, says the IPCC scientist, will an anthropogenic effect on climate change be identified? It's not surprising. The best answer is we don't know. That was honest of them. That was what they put in the final draft of their report in 1995, the second of their four big assessment reports. This, the precise opposite, is what the bureaucrats chose to publish after getting a rewrite from one scientist. So we're not talking about a scientific consensus, we're talking about a political party line imposed from the centre regardless of what the scientists actually believe. And now watch this fraudulent piece of science from the 2007 fourth assessment report. This is a sine wave and you'll all know roughly what that is. Its trend is zero. If however we take just the segment on the screen the trend is like that. If we move the arrow, the starting arrow progressively from left to right the trend progressively appears to descend. And therefore we get the entirely misleading impression by using this bogus technique that not only is there a downtrend in a graph where we know there's a zero trend, but that in fact it's an accelerating downtrend. If we took a different phase of the graph, of course, we can show precisely the opposite. What's this got to do with climate? Watch the screen. There is the temperature record for the last 160 years from the Hadley Center. No particular reason to argue with that. But I do have a reason to argue with the various trend lines they've put on it. Uh, they're all correctly calculated for the periods they're looking at. But they've drawn the entirely incorrect conclusion in three places. That because of these trend lines and their relative slopes, the rate of global warming is accelerating and we are to blame. That conclusion is bogus. I have challenged both the head of the IPCC and the third listed lead author of that report to have this error corrected. They have declined to do so, nor have they been able to tell me that this is correct. All they want to do is to tell you there is a problem which may or may not exist. Here is the graph as it was quite correctly submitted by the scientists in their final draft with a single trend line correctly calculated covering the entire period. No rate of acceleration there. Indeed, I could use the same technique as they have used and show that between 1905 and 1945, roughly, there was a, an, a rate of increase in temperature which is twice as much as that between 1905 and 2005 and come to the opposite conclusion that global warming is in fact in decline. That conclusion would be just as wrong as the conclusion that they drew. But if I can use the same methods on the same data and come to an opposite conclusion, then it is the method that is bogus. The true position is that there are cyclical periods roughly every 60 years coinciding broadly with the Pacific Decadal Oscillation of rapid warming followed by periods of decline or, or the sort of static uh, period that we've got at the moment. These three periods are absolutely in parallel. There has been no increase whatsoever in the rate at which global warming occurs. There is the Hadley Center's surface record of global temperature over the period of the last 10 years. Once again, it confirms the satellite record I showed you earlier. If anything, a slight decline in global temperatures. Here is what the Climate Gate emailers say about it. No global warming for a decade. We can't explain why. It's a travesty that we can't. Well, now, I have got a few more slides, which I don't propose to show you now, on how we can calculate how much warming we might expect over the next 100 years using the IPCC's methods. I'll flick through them only very quickly, showing, first of all, that there is a decline in each successive report in their prediction of how much warming there's going to be. It's still way, way above where it should be. By this method, by these two methods, and by these two methods, we can demonstrate using their own data and their own methods in all respects that the amount of warming they should be predicting is less than half the 3.26 Celsius, which is their central estimate for the next century. So my scientific conclusions then is that the IPCC has exaggerated likely 21st century global warming, and you can show this on its own methods, two to five times over. And th finally, the next steps for Maryland, I think you do now see why it is that I recommend you need a proper cost-benefit analysis. You need to wait and see, given the, the decline in sea level at the moment, given the decline in global temperatures over the last 10 years, whether this decade of cooling and of sea level stasis will continue. You need to be prepared to make focused adaptation to any climate change in any direction. Climate change does happen in both directions, nothing much to do with us. You always need to be ready for it. And as Commissioner Rothschild has rightly said, let technology and the markets do their job. Central planning has a place, but it is a limited one. Remember the horse poop story that he told you. We can't always foresee what's going to happen next, and most certainly we should not base plans 
on data taken from only one side of the argument and very carefully selected. I have shown you data from all sides of the argument and have drawn the logical conclusion that it is far more expensive to act than not to act on man-made global warming. Finally, watch China. Why do I say this? Because their emissions are increasing so rapidly that if you were to shut Maryland down entirely, then the emissions that you forego would be taken up by the increase in China's emissions in less than one month. So Plan Maryland's report card, here it is. I'm afraid they get naught out of ten. I'm going to mark that down bluntly as a fail. And my recommendation is that you remember Canute. You'll see he's wearing my Viscount coronet here. He couldn't stop sea level rising. Or can the state of Maryland, however determined his, its governor is, to try to do so? And this is what Canute said. Verily, my flatterers, we hold not so much power as ye believe. Mind ye well, then, that reigneth one only king, he that is almighty, he that governeth the sea and holdeth the ocean in the hollow of his hand. Keep ye then your praises unto him alone. Thank you.